Well, good evening. Uh, as always, it's a privilege to be up here in front of you, and, and singing a song like that is just so, so tremendous, and, and I hope um, helps set the tone for what we do when we open the Word of God at any time here in, in the gatherings of this church, that we are coming to behold our God through His Word, that we would adore Him, that we would see Him as He is high and lifted up, that we would, through the, the, the preaching of the Word, that we would behold His majesty. And uh, in the youth group and in most of our services around here, there's, there's a little bit of a running joke that's, that's been established that kind of even played itself out this Wednesday uh, with one of the students as they were talking with Mr. Servius and I um, in school about whether or not they were going to come to youth group that Wednesday. And they asked the question, what are we learning in youth group? And the answer is simple. It's what, what the answer to the, the question is most of the time when we say, what, what are we preaching on this Sunday? What's happening in our next service? And the answer, very simply, is the next verse. And week to week, Philip is going to be preaching. We know, well, where is he going to be? What, what's the topic for this Sunday? The next verse. Now, I say all that to say that tonight we will not be in the next verse of Genesis 6. Instead, we're going to be detouring uh, this evening into 1 John, where I've, where I've had the opportunity to be preaching for the last several months in the student ministry. So tonight, we're going to be in 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3, and while you're turning there, I want to give you a little bit of um, orientation into where we're going to be in the text, because before we get to the next verse, we've got to set the context. John is the same apostle that we learned about this morning in Matthew chapter 10, called to be in close fellowship with Jesus. He's, uh, at the time of this, the writing of 1 John, he's, uh, he's an old man. Uh, most likely, he had already written the Gospel of John, his Gospel record of Jesus' life. Uh, but there were, as there are today, many enemies to the truth. And John, as history records for us, had been ministering in the church at Ephesus and in Asia Minor for quite some time. And, and what, what history tells us is, and what we'll see this evening from 1 John, is that some of these enemies of the truth were what came to be known as the Gnostics. They were people who were... Um, uh, heretics who, who would teach a whole bunch of different errors, some of which we'll see coming out tonight. They, they were teaching things that were uh, denying that, that Jesus was the Son of God. They were um, teaching that uh, a doctrine that would later become known as Manichaeism, that all physical matter, all things like that was evil and only the spiritual was good, that there was essentially dualism, that there was an ongoing cosmic battle between good and evil, and like many heresies today, they taught that Jesus wasn't quite the Son of God, uh, that Satan was elevated more than Scripture tells us that he is and his power and his abilities and his person, and that Jesus and Satan were essentially dueling it out, and we find ourselves somewhere in the middle. In this teaching that taught that the physical universe and everything tangible is evil and that only the invisible really mattered, it led to a teaching that it didn't matter what deeds you did in your body with your flesh, you could sin and be disobedient because these things were only done in the physical realm. They didn't really affect your spirit, which is the only thing that mattered. They taught something close to this dualism, that, that somehow you could act out however you wanted, as long as you said you believed in Jesus. As long as you profess some faith in Jesus, doesn't even have to be the right one, you're okay. It didn't matter what your behavior, what your conduct was. As long as you say you believe in a Jesus, you're sure to be fine. And as a result of their teaching, the churches in Ephesus and in this area that John had a relationship, they were being shaken from a joyful confidence in the true gospel. They didn't know what it was or whether or not they had believed that right gospel. Here are people who were teaching a very different message than John had taught and acting very different than John had taught them to act. And yet, they were still proclaiming themselves to be believers. So how could they know? How could anyone know what the true message was, what the true gospel was, and whether or not they were in Christ, truly forgiven, truly saved, truly children of God? So John writes this epistle with the intent, as he tells us in chapter 5, verse 17, these things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. So this whole epistle functions in tight spirals. 
It, it sometimes covers ground that it's just discussed and then loops back around and expands on it more to a theme that it's already mentioned. And, and for that purpose, that those who have believed in the Son of God may know that they have eternal life. So this is an epistle written to believers to encourage them in what they had believed from a first-hand witness of what had been proclaimed to them. John actually opens up this epistle with that view in chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, when he says, What was from the beginning, what we've heard, what we've seen with our eyes, what we've looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was manifested and we have seen and testify and proclaim to you the eternal life. What we've seen and heard we proclaim emphasizing the fact that he is a first-hand witness. In other words, John had particular first-hand, hands-on knowledge of, is what he's proclaiming. And what he's proclaiming is concerning the word of life, the, the word that he wrote in his gospel that was manifested, that took on flesh, contrary to what these heretics were teaching, and that dwelt among us. So here in chapter 3, set right in the midst of distinguishing between who are the children of the devil and the children of God, you have an awesome reminder. But one that I fear sometimes can be just commonplace, so commonplace that we brush it aside. This reminder is, in verse 11, this is the message which you've heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Something that I believe most people, whether or not they even identify as Christians, would say, yeah, that's great. That's a wonderful message. We should love one another. But like I said, I think there's a strong temptation to brush this command aside. There's a possibility of us responding, well, yes, of course I love my brother. Of course I love the people of God, so let's move on. Or there's a temptation that we say, I'm pretty sure I love the brethren, Never really done any investigation or inquiry or examination about what that means, but I'm sure that I do because I'm a believer, and John says that believers are supposed to love the brethren. I've trusted in Christ, so I must love the brethren without ever bringing any examination to their conduct. When actually, that's the reverse of what John tells us. John gives us the pattern. We reverse it. I'm a believer, therefore I'm sure I love the brethren. Rather than following what John says, we know that we've passed out of death into life because we love the brethren. In other words, our confidence arises out of our conduct. Not from it, but out of it. This conduct has to come from somewhere because we don't naturally love. In fact, most of the time, we're, we're not even really sure what love is, but we're sure we're doing it. And in some of that confusion of, I'm sure that I love my brother, if we actually begin to do any examination, we're looking sometimes for the wrong thing. We're looking for, well, do I feel a warm and fuzzy towards them? Do I like them? Do I love them? Now, I see this actually at my house in a really unique way. Most of you know I've got three kids. I've got Abby, who's the oldest. Reese is in the middle at two and a half. And Remy, who's almost seven months. And Reese, at two and a half, loves his little brother. And he tells us that all the time. I just love him. The trouble is he's two and a half. And he's all boy. And he doesn't understand the phrase, be gentle. And what we'll experience so often is that he doesn't know how to love. And I know that because of his actions, because of his conduct. He grabs his brother's leg and yanks. He comes by and walks on his fingers. He hits him on the back as he goes running by. And when we ask, well, why did you do that? Because I love him. My son, Reese, loves to touch and snuggle and be cuddled. He loves to put his hands on you. One of the things that he'll say, as soon as I get home from work, let's wrestle. Why? Because I love you. He just doesn't understand that his seven-month-old brother, who's about 20 pounds lighter, can't take as much of the kind of love that he's giving. 
So we're confident that we love. Even if our words or actions communicate something different, we feel it sometimes, maybe, as we join hands and sing, blessed be the tie that binds, there's a great, wonderful feeling of, sure, I love these people, but is that scriptural love? John here, in chapter 3, verses 11 through 18, John is going to present a different picture. John is going to present a command to love, a caution about love, the confidence of one who does love, and the conduct of one who knows love. Those will be our four points this evening as we look at the command, the caution, the confidence, and the conduct of one who knows love. So first, let's look at the command together. And and I'll go ahead and warn you, this is where we'll spend a good amount of time looking at what this command actually is here in verse 11. Now, as I've already mentioned, this is set in the context of John delineating, expanding on the idea of what separates, what sets apart those who are the children of God and the children of the devil. And so really, we'll begin in verse 10. By this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. Verse 11. For this is the message which you've heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. This is so simple, so straightforward. We should love one another. One of the amazing things about this is that John is essentially teaching this from his own gospel When John writes in this epistle, the message which you've heard from the beginning, very often he's essentially referring to his own gospel of Jesus' life. In John's gospel, the love of God is a major theme. And I think John has this in mind, and we'll see this as we walk through here. So hold your place in 1 John. I want to show you what John is talking about, this message that they've had. Hold your place and turn with me to John the Gospel of John, beginning in verse, excuse me, beginning in chapter 13. John chapter 13, verses 34 through 35. Jesus, as he is coming into the final hours with his disciples before he's going to die to make atonement for their sins and the sins of the world. Jesus has gathered his disciples together. He has demonstrated service to them. He has demonstrated what a a, a godly leader looks like in serving them. And in the midst of this, he says in verse 34, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Verse 35 By this all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. When Jesus returns to this theme of loving one another, just a chapter later, just in chapter 15, it's it's not a very long time in the same evening that he's speaking these things in John's presence, that he says this in verse 12 of chapter 15. This is my commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. Again, in verse 17, it'll be repeated. This I command you, that you love one another. So here's the command. Love one another. This will come up again, but look at what he's saying here. One another. Jesus is addressing this to his disciples. This is, and if you remember in 1 John, when John is writing these things, he's writing this to the believers, to those who have believed that Jesus is the Son of God. So there's a distinct kind of love that John and originally Jesus are talking about here. It's love for those who are also believers. This morning in Sunday school, Eric Nelson shared his his testimony with the students there. And one of the things he mentioned that marked his life after he came to know the Lord was that his company changed. He didn't and doesn't want to hang out with those who don't love the Lord. He didn't want to be around their stories. He didn't want to be around their conduct. He was changing his desire towards them. Why? Because believers love believers. They have a unique familial connection to one another. Believers love believers. And it's a command that's grown out of our identity with Christ. 
John earlier in 1 John, if you want to flip back there, tells us this in chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. Marking out those who say that they know God but don't back it up by their actions. John says this in verse 10. The one who loves his brother abides in the light and there's no cause for stumbling in him. It's an essential identity of the believer that we love one another. One saint has said this, the mark that, Je- that Jesus gives to label a Christian, not just in one era or one locality, but at all times and all places until Jesus returns, is love. Paul is going to make this command throughout his writings. By the way, he's not alone. Jesus, throughout his ministry, if you think this is something unique to John's gospel, Jesus, when challenged, on summing up the law, so the law was summed up in loving God with everything we have and loving our neighbor. This stems from a quote from Leviticus 19, 18, you shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the sons of your people. By the way, did you notice that? The uniqueness of against whom this relationship is to be with, against your people, unique in the sight of God, connected to one another, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Paul, throughout his writings, is going to reiterate this command as well. In Romans chapter 12, as he transitions from what the gospel is to what the gospel does, he commands in chapter 12, verses 9 through 10, let love be without hypocrisy. And a little bit further on, be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor. To the Galatians, Paul is going to remind them that the first fruit of the Spirit is love. Reminding them in chapter 6, verse 14, the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. In Ephesians, the theme of love is going to come up again and again. But just one reference there in chapter 5, verse 1, Paul, in exhorting the Ephesians to walk as reconciled saints to the Lord, tells them, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love, just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us. In fact, in his epistle to the Thessalonians, Paul says that he was refreshed to hear the news from them. In chapter 3, verse 6, after he sent Timothy to them, he says, But now that Timothy has come from you and has brought good news of your faith and love, we were comforted. So that Paul says then that his prayer for them in the midst of persecution, in the midst of all sorts of difficulty, he says that his prayer for them is that the Lord cause you to increase and abound in love for one another and for all people just as we also do for you. And the time will keep us from going further on, but hopefully we've gotten just a taste of how essential the Scripture views love for the believers as an identity, as part of our identity as believers. And please understand, this is something that those who are not believers don't know anything about. Look with me at Titus chapter 3. There's there's a number of places that we can go, but this is one of, I believe, the clearest and, and most poignant statements on this. Titus chapter 3, Paul is commanding the, the, uh, Titus to remind the saints how they ought to behave because they're not who they were. In Titus chapter 3 and verse 3, he says this, For we also once were foolish ourselves, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. That was the characteristic of of an unbeliever, hatred towards one another. So this is the command, love one another, that we should love one another. But John, remember, he's going off of Jesus' teaching in John chapter 15. And there's a caution that should be added to this. We have the command, next we have the caution. And there's two essentially parallel warnings that are issued here in 1 John 3. Because John is moving through Jesus' teaching on this. First, essentially in chapter 12, he's going to say, don't be like Cain. 1 John chapter 3, verse 12. Having said that we should love one another, verse 12, he says, not as Cain, who was of the evil one and slew his brother. And for what reason did he slay him? Because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. 
Here, in distinguishing between the sons of the devil and the sons of God, John essentially gives us a case study in one who didn't love his brother. These are the first brothers, Cain and Abel. We see how Cain did not love his brother, not as Cain, because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. Don't be like Cain. He didn't love his brother. And essentially, this will be the way that John introduces this second caution. Don't be like Cain, but secondly, he's going to tell them, verse 13, don't be surprised. Because it's been this way since the beginning. Cain and Abel are just exhibit A of this. The righteous are put to death by the evil. That's why we see this command here in verse 13. Don't be surprised. Do not be surprised, brethren, if the world hates you. Why not? Because we've noted, Titus chapter 3, that's what they do. They do the deeds of their father, the devil. That's what Jesus said in, in, in John's gospel in chapter 8. There Jesus is, is in, uh, having another encounter with the Pharisees. And he finally says, you're seeking to kill me. A man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God, this Abraham would not do because they were insisting that they were children of Abraham. Surely they must be all right. And Jesus tells them, you're doing the deeds of your father. When they argue and insist that Abraham is their father, Jesus tells them his word, the word of the father, has no place in them. Why? Because you're of your father, the devil. You want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning. Look back with me again in John chapter 15. John chapter 15 We'll begin again in verse 17. This, this I command you, Jesus tells his disciples, that you love one another. And immediately following in verse 18, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. Remember the word I said to you, a slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know the one who sent me. If I had come and spoken to them, they would not have sinned, but now they have no excuse for their sin. He who hates me hates my father also. Look with me at verse 25. But they have done this to fulfill the word that is written in their law, they hated me without a cause. We see this, and, and he has stated this elsewhere, even in the Gospels. If they treated the master of the house this way, putting him to death, how will they treat the servants? Paul, in closing his epistle to Timothy, or in his closing epistle to Timothy, the last one that he will write, is going to state plainly, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Peter, in one of his letters to the dispersed believers, will write to them, don't be surprised at the fiery trial that has befallen you, as if something strange were happening. Why? Well, because this is part and parcel of being a child of God. So John cautions us, don't be surprised. Two things before moving on from the command in this caution we, we so easily forget. We sort of lull ourselves into thinking that peace and safety are the norm. That somehow security and a life free from hardship is what we should expect. When in reality, the thing that we've been learning as we have been going through the next verse in Genesis is that we live in a world that is utterly permeated with sin and its effects. And what Christ has told us is that if we make it plain that we're his disciples for our love for one another or by our love for one another, we will be hated by the world. But following out of this command and this caution, John gives us a reason for confidence. Because remember, this is written that you would know, those who have believed in the Son would know that they have eternal life. So go back with me to 1 John chapter 3. The very next verse, verse 14, John is going to tell us, we know 
that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brethren. A hallmark of being in life with Christ is loving like Christ. If this love is absent from you, John writes, everyone who does not love abides in death, which is an echo, actually, of something that he's already said in chapter 2. Chapter 2, verse 11, John says this, the one who hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Back in chapter 3, he continues this evaluation. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Now, John uses a very peculiar word here for murderer. He he doesn't use the word that's typically used and translated in your New Testament for murder. In fact, it's it's almost exclusively found here in uh, John's epistle. And it's, and it's akin to the word for a manslayer. It's someone who has part in murder, taking the life of another. It's someone who puts to death. And again, as we've already seen from John chapter 8, this is a hallmark of the devil. If the hallmark of believers is love, then the hallmark of the devil is murder and hatred. It's the antithesis of love. Remember, we've already mentioned the fruit of the Spirit is love. And if we're not loving, we're not demonstrating that we have Christ in us. There's no distinction. There's no distinction between us and the world. If we love the world, 1 John chapter 2, the love of the Father is not in us. If we love the things of this world, which are passing away, if we love the people of this world, not in the way that, that, that God tells us to love them, in a pitiable sense, that we love them compassionately, but we love them enviously. If we have that kind of love, we don't know the love of God. So where's the distinction? Remember, we gain a confidence from our conduct. We have confidence that we're partakers of life if we are those who practice love for the brethren. Because that's the distinctive birthmark of believers. This love will then produce in our relationships a strain. The world will hate us because we love the brothers. And because we love Christ. Because we identify with him. If we're not encountering this opposition from the world... Perhaps it's because we don't know Jesus. Perhaps it's because we're not living like we do. Which would then be a drain on our confidence of whether or not we know him. Now wait, 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 wait. A couple of uh, objections will go up here. Does that mean that no murderers can have eternal life? Is this saying that if you have taken the life of another, no, I don't believe that that's what that's saying. I think there's ample biblical evidence like Moses or David, that would tell us that's not what John's saying here. In fact, even the tense of the verb that's used here, and John is going to tell us that this is one who is murdering. That the posture, the practice of their life, as John has already covered in verses 4 through 10 of chapter 3, that the practice of sin, if this is the ongoing pattern and practice of your life, you don't know that you've passed out of death into life. If the ongoing pattern and practice of your life is one that has hatred, because hatred is murder, John says in verse 15, everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. If that's the pattern and practice of your life, you cannot have confidence that you are a believer. Second objection Well, I don't hate anybody. I just really, really don't. And we'll soften it all sorts of ways. Don't like spending time with them. I really, really don't like them. I really just, I have other people I would rather spend my, all sorts of ways that we will categorically play the shell game and shuffle it around to say, it's not that I hate them. But if something really bad was to happen with them, and we almost make it trivial. 
Understand, when Jesus is categorizing in the Sermon on the Mount, those who are committing murder in their heart, it's those who speak ill of others. So what does this love look like? Because I need to know, we can know, verse 14, we know that we've passed out of, out of death into life because we love the brethren. So hopefully you've already gotten that this love isn't necessarily the warm and fuzzies. It's, it's not necessarily, well, I, I just like them. What does this love look like, and how do I know if I'm loving the brethren? And that brings us to our final point, our conduct. We've looked at the command. We've looked at the caution. We've seen the confidence. But fourthly, we look at the conduct. Verse 16. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? Now, I, I get to illustrate this different ways with some of the students in the student ministry. Um, and hopefully they land about the same with you all. I think that they will. Between verse 14 and verse 16, John uses two different words that are translated the exact same way for us. In verse 14, when he says, we know that we have passed out of death into life, he uses a word that essentially John uses to mean recognition, head knowledge, he acknowledges. That you know something. I recognize the factuality of that. But in verse 16, he uses a different word. One that John consistently uses in reference to experience that he uses in reference to you know something and I think we've all been here I think we've all experienced this where we say well hey I know that person well I don't know know them for us we just add an inflection in another form of the word I don't know them but I know them even just the other day I was corrected in something where I said yeah I, I know that I'm like no you don't know it okay I recognize it so we struggle to communicate this distinction. Little wonder the translators were a little less than nuanced when they put this in here. We know that we've passed from death to life. We know love by this, verse 16. In verse 16, it is this no knowing. We know love by this. That he laid down his life for us. Our experience with love is what Christ did and dying as a substitute for us. How do we know what love is? How do we define love? How can we describe what love is? We look at the cross. We look at Christ. How is it that believers know how to interact with one another? Because that's where this is going. This is the conduct point. How do we know how to love? We look at Christ. We hear this so often in Ephesians chapter 5. Husbands, love your wives. As Pastor Philip reminds us consistently. And we're not left to our own objective standard about what that love looks like. He tells us, as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. We know love by this. That he laid down his life for us. We know love, in other words. We recognize what it is. We have an experience of contact with it from Christ's conduct. And by the way, remember, John is still coming off of Christ's own words in John chapter 15. Let me show you. John chapter 15 and verse 12. This is my commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. Well, what would that love look like, Jesus? Verse 13 of John chapter 15. Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. We see this exact same thing recorded by Paul in Romans chapter 5. 
Romans chapter 5, beginning in verse 5. Paul writes, hope does not disappoint. Because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who is given to us. For while we were yet, excuse me, while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Can I tell you, just as an aside and a point of application, our love for the brethren is not based on their worth. It's not based on their performance. That's certainly not the way that Christ has loved us. We do not say, I love that person because they so have earned it. In what way have you earned the love of Christ? What way could you earn the love of Christ? While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We know love by this that he laid down his life for us. We even know it from John's own gospel in chapter 3, verse 16, one of the most well-known verses in all of the scripture. John chapter 3, verse 16. Just put your eyes on it with me. It's so familiar that I think we run over it sometimes and we don't grab it. John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world. In other words, he loved it in this way, your translation might read. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Paul is going to capture this exact same idea that love, a godly Christ-like love demands sacrifice. When Paul writes this in his own testimony, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me in the life which I now live. In the flesh I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Understand, the kind of love that we are commanded, we should love one another is a sacrificial love towards those who do not deserve it, if it would be Christ-like. He's essentially going to make, John will essentially make the same point in the very next chapter. If you're still in 1 John chapter 3, look over the page or maybe turn over the page with me to chapter 4 and verse 7. Beloved, 1 John 4, 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Same knows. The one who does not love God does not know God, for God is love. In this is verse uh, 10. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. So John tells us where this ought to lead us in 1 John chapter 3. How do we know what love is? We look to Christ. We look to the cross. We're undeserving. More than undeserving. Understand, we were enemies of God, haters of God, at war with God, having no, as Ephesians chapter um, 3 would tell us, having no claim excuse me, chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 2 would tell us, we have no claim on the promises of God or the goodness of God. We're outsiders. Yet, in Christ, we've been brought near. Verse 16 of chapter 3, 1 John chapter 3. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Now, pause, because there's a temptation to say, well, I would absolutely die for any of my brothers in Christ. Okay, but would you inconvenience yourself for them? Would you show up for them? 
Would you confront them in their sin? Would you encourage them? Would you have the hard conversations with them? Laying down our lives, we love as long as it's the hypothetical, I might have to die, but you might have to see them next week too. This means more than just martyrdom. It refers to intentional, purposeful laying down something. You you look this up. We ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Sometimes we just think, I'm just going to, okay, I'll put it away. I'll put it aside. It's the idea of you've laid it down on purpose. The desired outcome of demonstrating the love of Christ. One pastor said that this expression refers to something far more extensive than only sacrificial death for fellow believers is clear from the next statement about having goods that someone needs. Verse 17, but whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how can the love of God abide in him? How can we claim to know, to know, and have the love of Christ if we don't actually practice that same love. If we would say, yes, Christ died for me, sacrificed, laid it down. And you think of the fullness of what Christ accomplished in in laying his life down. Because you have to understand that Christ lived a righteous life for our sake. His righteousness has been exchanged for our unrighteousness on the cross. He who knew no sin became sin so that we might have the righteousness of Christ in him. In other words, the the righteousness of Christ is credited to all those who place their faith in him, meaning that every resistance to temptation on the part of Christ was for the salvation of believers. What things are you fighting for the sake of your brothers? What sin are you combating out of love for the saints? What things are you denying? What comforts? Think about Jesus' prayer recorded for us in the Gospel of Luke in the garden. Father, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. Christ, despising the shame, endured the cross. What are you suffering out of love for other believers? Understand what he's saying here in verse 17, this conduct of love. It must be in deed. It must translate into conduct. This is exactly what we see in other places in Scripture. James chapter 2 One commentator said, love is not a fragile treasure to be tucked away discreetly and securely. It's a robust virtue to be practiced in everyday life. And it's not just the extravagant, let's let everybody know, because we've already seen in Matthew what happens when we proclaim our righteousness before others. It's the everyday, mundane, laying down your life because Christ laid down his. It's the response. If Christ laid down his life, we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Now, before we get to a final conclusion, let me just bring up something, because so often, again, we can think big, martyrdom. We can think, great, yeah, I love them. I lay down, I set aside Think through the epistles as Paul deals with Christian liberties, is what we typically call them. Things that we would abstain from for the sake of the brethren. Why? Out of love for them. That's what motivates it. But so often, we we like to stay in those big areas. Well, I don't do these things because it would cause my brother to stumble. Therefore, I'm loving them. But we have what one author has called the respectable sins. We have the sins that, well, they're not loving, but they're certainly not too bad. One pastor has put it this way. 
inconsiderate talk, disregard for other people's time or moral conscience, taking advantage of people, tactlessness, ignoring the contributions and ideas of others, running roughshod over other people, basic discourtesy and rudeness are all a lack of love and have no place in the local church. How about that? How about just the way that we interact with one another in courtesy and in kindness? Are we loving the brethren? Understand, this is the command. This is the command that we ought to, that we should love the brethren. And it's so easy to walk over, to take for granted, to say, an assumption, yes, yes, I, I, I love the brethren. But is it backed up by your conduct? Is it backed up in the way that you speak, in the way that you live, in the way that you manage your time? In one of the books that we've gone through in the Steadfast Servants men's group uh, on Wednesday mornings, one of the things that it, it hit on was, are you just consumed with service in, in the life of the local church, even in places where you park? I know that's a rough topic on a rainy day. But are you considerate of that? Are you considerate in how you respond to the screaming children? I've got one. Are you considerate in how you make your plans for the next several weeks? How can I encourage the brethren? How can I serve the church? One of the things that I love about being involved in the things that go on around here is, is working with the calendar. And, and I joke with uh, my wife in particular, I, and, and I've joked with the teens about this. I live several months ahead. Um, for me, I'm, I'm really excited about August. Um, I've got on my, on my whiteboard in my classroom, Ian can tell you about this. Ian Nelson's one of my students. He was the first one that I afflicted with this. Right as we got into single-digit countdown days to the end of the year, I put up how many until we come back. There was this universal groan ac across the classroom. 92, what is not? Oh, no. But one of the things that comes with knowing the calendar is knowing how many opportunities there are to serve. It means knowing kids camp is coming up. Have you availed yourself? VBS prep is in just a few weeks. VBS will be here. It's going to be phenomenal. Do you love the brothers? We have a mission trip. Do you love the brothers? All of those will cost you your time, your energy, maybe a little bit of your sanity. We have, just at the end of this week, a marvelous evangelistic opportunity playing softball or watching them play softball and enjoy the food like Eric mentioned this morning. Do you love the brothers? How will that affect that command? We should love the brethren. How will that affect your calendar? What will that cost you? Because remember, John said there's a caution don't be surprised when the world hates you, when you have to turn down other things, when you have to use your vacation time to love the brethren. It brings with it a confidence that you know that you've passed from death to life because you love the brethren. Because finally, this conduct is rooted in you being a recipient of the love of Christ. If you know love, if you know love, you will love. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, you have loved us so greatly, so extravagantly. You have loved us when we were unlovely. You love us still. You began a good work and you We'll see it through to the day of completion. And Father, from that, that love takes root in us and it grows and produces fruit of love in our life for the brothers. 
Father God, you've provided opportunities and abundance for us to love and serve. May we be obedient. May we have that confidence of knowing that we've passed from death to life by our love for the brethren. Father, we thank you and we praise you for these things. In the name of your son, amen.